kind introduction for an uh, uh, honorable guest uh, trainer, Kim Godfrey. That's we've we've had the training from her about three months ago. The training has stayed in our heart, everybody's heart, for three months. Resonated in your heart, inside out. I can see that from your work at workplace. You communicate way better now. <laughs> so the uh, uh, with with the privilege uh, now, I would like to invite Kim to come. Kim come back again to give us a ACE corporate tr communication training 2.0. So now let's welcome King Godfrey and King Godfrey ACE corporate communication training 2.0. Thank you very much, you. And it's a pleasure to return back to ACE and to see familiar faces, even if I've forgotten your names. Because I believe everyone except Nikki was at the last train, <laughs> if I'm right. Yeah, you all were, so. weren't you? So that's fantastic. So definitely it's 2.0 for all of us. And it's just a delight to hear that this communication aspect has stayed in your hearts. <laughs> and that you've improved your skills and it's been evident. Yeah. Well, what we're going to do today is build on that some more. That's definitely our aim. So we're all about professional communication today. So there's some overlap with what we've done. I'm going to do a quick revisit of some of the concepts we covered last time and then we're going to move on to some new ones as well. So let's look at what we're going to cover today. And of course, as usual, if you would like to ask questions as we go along, please do. That would be great to have the interaction. It's your training. Remember that. It's for you. So if you've got any particular questions that you want to throw into the, onto the table or comments, they're welcome. So let's, let's look at our aims. What do we want to do? Have a review of, our effective, of what effective communication is. I introduce a concept that some might know, or perhaps you don't, something called moments of truth. We will look at our customer service model, which will tie in quite strongly with moments of truth. Look at what is assertive language and managing complaints and conflict. So I've really added in a couple of extra things there that weren't on my outline, so I hope you're ready to go from you know, communication, professional communication 2.0, we're flying ahead to 3.0 combined. So let's move forward. And just to let you know too, for today I've got a file with all the slide notes for you. I've got three activities that we're going to do in pairs and then I'm going to get you to do an evaluation like I did last time. So let us move on and look at, well, what is effective communication? And I've just put um, my definition together. So it's when two or more people communicate and achieve understanding. We're clarifying and discussing where need be, and it may be by spoken or written means. And there's probably other means that are possible in there, but I've kept it simple. And at its heart, effective communication helps us work together better and helps us build relationships. And this is at the heart of business, isn't it? Building relationships. I've put together a model of communication and this is certainly my model. And I've called it in case, in case to encase people because I believe this is what happens when we communicate. But simply put, we've got our speaker who encodes, puts some ideas together, finds a way of expressing it. This all takes place in some environment. So in our environment today is in this office, round a table, face to face. And then the listener or listeners decode what's said. But of course, we might have difficulty here. This speaker might not be super clear, and this listener might have great difficulty decoding, so we'll have a feedback loop here where the person might ask questions and we get clarification. So what does in case mean? 
and it's just a way of looking at communication as far as I'm as far as I'm concerned. So the E stands for environment where this takes place. Could be it could cover our online communication as well. So we've got all sorts of different environments, obviously face to face, phone, online. So that's our E environment. Then we've got our N for nonverbal skills or body language, things like eye contact, gestures, could be movement, posture, all these different non-verbal aspects that is included in communication. So if I go like that, it has a meaning. Some gesture obviously has meaning, some is not specific. Then we move on to C, which I've called cognitive. And what that refers to really is what the speaker knows about their listeners. And this is foundational in a way because we alter our communication to suit our listeners based on what we know about them, our relationships with them. What, it might be a gender difference, it might be cultural difference or similarity, it can be educational backgrounds, it could be ability, disability, all these different factors and all our knowledge of what we know about people goes into shifting how we communicate with them. So cognitive is super important in my opinion. In, I've also got in there, we've got power and status, age as well, factors that we're taking into consideration. In case, that was our C for cognitive. Then we've got A for auditory. So there are a whole heap of sub-skills in there, but you can call it listening, active listening, but in that A for auditory, we've got things like, am I attending or not? This is foundational, or am I actually a little bit distracted so I won't hear all the information? Um, we've got uh, attention, we've got things like auditory memory, we've got things like auditory di discrimination, which is listening to the differences between sounds as well, um, and hearing levels um, and comprehension. So depending on what your language level is, you might comprehend more or less. So that's our A. Then we move down to S, spoken verbal, and we've got a whole um, cluster of uh, skills in there that come under you know, my category of spoken verbal. So we've got things like sentence construction, we've got vocabulary, we've got actually pr pronunciation of words or articulation in there. I've included tone, so I've put a whole host of skills in that category of spoken language. And then finally, at the bottom, on its very own, we have emotional, or nothing else written beside it. And it's just that our emotions, depending on how we're feeling, can impact on all of these areas, really especially this particular area, but it may influence your listening as well if you're feeling highly emotional or upset or something like that, although I'm sure with the majority of guys in the room that you don't have those experiences, you don't get upset, and perhaps that's not the word to use anyway, it might be more angry or something like that. But all these things can impact how we hear, how we speak and so on. As you're well aware, I'm not teaching you anything new here. So that's a bit of, a, of an overview about our spoken communication using this in-case model. Now, I think I've really gone on to repeat myself with this one. It's things just put in a slightly different way. Um, and this, what I put at the top is this, uh, what I've really put C for cognitive in our previous slide, and your awareness of your audience, so important, or your listener and what they know, what they understand, their backgrounds, all those sorts of things, because that's important to how you adjust how you speak. Is it a client? Is it a colleague? Is it uh, a stakeholder? Um, and that'll shift what you do. What's, what's the power, what we call power distance ratio, um, perceived power distance could be. We've got our listening, we've covered that. And then what I didn't include, I suppose, is what your aims of communication are. And I 
with these sorts of slides and this sort of time frame, things aren't going to be in great depth, but I've talked about the different sorts of aims that you might have. You might be asking, persuading, infor informing people, trying to entertain, and sometimes we're trying to do multiple things at once. Um, build relationships, etc. Complement, educate, research, all these things. The rest over that we have covered in that previous slide. So that's a bit about your communication areas. What can impact your communication negatively? Let's have a look at that for mm -hmm. a minute. And the slide I'm going to show you doesn't have environment. But we've talked about E for environment and that can certainly play a part in a barrier to communication. So for example, if we're in a noisy area or, or in a distracting place, that can impact you. But this next slide is actually looking at what people are doing in their communication to make barriers for communication. Now, would any of you ever name call each other, criticise, sort of diagnose what's going wrong? All these sort of rather negative things, threaten each other, order direct, <laughs> imperiously direct people around. What else have we got? Not moralising. Sorry? You said? Uh, moralising. Moralising, yeah, 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 exactly. That's a, that's a good one. What else? Advising. Um, too much questioning. That's an interesting strategy, actually. And it, it, by questioning, you keep control of things. So that could feel a little uncomfortable for people if you are questioning too much. Reassuring, diverting, a logical, logical argument. Trying to convince people of what you're saying is correct and not listening, perhaps, to their points of view. So here we've got these under the different areas. Judgment, sending solutions maybe where they're not wanted or we need to work together to find solutions, then there's that good old avoidance where this is really uncomfortable. We don't, uh, uh, don't, don't want to communicate together. So they're the sorts of barriers that you need to watch out for. I'm sure there could be some more subtle things than that going on that might be barriers. And I... I contemplated today the whole idea of trust and how important that is in terms of our communication and that really it's a foundation for us, isn't it? That sense of the trust. And when it is not there, it is sometimes hard to have that effective communication. And I'm only reflecting on my own experience here um, and, and uh, difficulties that I've had. So they're the sorts of bar barriers that you can have. But of course we want to remove all of those, don't we? So let's just for a moment have a look at what we covered briefly on build your brand, build your business, communicate to build your brand and business. So let's have a looking look in, simple, in a simple way we've covered the importance of listening listening to others, making sure you're attending to them, um, and that the end result is that people will feel affirmed that you've listened carefully to what they've said. You're not only just listening to the words, but you're trying to read in between the lines in the sense of you're looking for the emotional content behind those words. Is there a match with what you're hearing. Do the words match with how they sort of sound overall? So that tone is really important. And actually, you was telling me before about his great camera and <laughs> talking about how he could see um, these differences in, in people's faces, whether they were really happy or not. And perhaps it relates down to looking here, but that we have these incredible visual skills that we can use to support um, uh, the communication process, um, that you're listening, you're watching, and looking for those 
changes in voice as we're saying, but are there shifts in body language as well? Is there a discrepancy with what we're hearing? And maybe the body language is getting a bit tight, but oh, I'm so relaxed about everything. Uh, I mean, I'm making a, a gross example, I suppose, but we're looking for those shifts. So listening and looking, also listening to yourself was an important message for you too, to think about how am I sounding in my communication? Am I as clear as I can be? Not only in terms of content, but can I be easily heard? We've touched on looking, and of course we talk about eye contact typically, but it's looking with a view to interpreting. What am I seeing in this person? Are they understanding, are they not? Are they bored, are they getting distracted? All these sorts of things. But that when we're looking at people and when it's our turn to talk, we get this um, ability to use our voice as well too because we're looking in the direction that we're talking in as opposed to, well, for example, if I'm um, talking to you like this, well, <laughs> my eye contact's very weird, uh, a wink, and, but also I'm projecting down to my screen, so that's not going to optimise your hearing and listening and certainly if we're in a less than ideal background. So that's about listening, looking. Then we're on to this next area of clarification, which is an important one for today, because we're going to do some work with this. So you receive your message, we've talked about that. Now, have you received it correctly? Do you need to check back and reflect back on what you've heard? So it might be checking, it might be also we talk about paraphrasing, which is repeating back what we've heard, typically in a slightly different way. I've got this point here, avoid costly misunderstandings. Well, that's the truth, that if you don't check, then you can make very costly errors. And I'm mindful of the airline industry, for example, where they use as a matter of course this, uh, it's called feedback readback mechanism where instructions are given, say to pilots, they repeat them back or clarify if you like, paraphrase, or, they're not paraphrasing, they're repeating back word for word and then that will go back to the control tower, they'll affirm it again to ensure so that they've got two points of that we've actually understood the message. That that not only what has been said has been heard, but then what that per, what the control tower has heard from that person is also correct to stop airline crashes. And our examples will be less uh, critical than that, but still critical uh, uh, critical examples in our workplaces exist. And then we've got our commu communicate to suit your audience and so on that we've covered. Speaking slowly, pausing, not too slowly obviously, but s for many people it can be a matter of slowing down a little bit. Listening to yourself, watch your word endings if you're aiming to improve your clarity, if that comes up for, as an issue for you. Try and have an interesting voice, watch your volume and you need to check in with your environment with regards to that. The more interference there is. Well, you may not have to go la a lot louder. The other technique is to use this a bit more. That you use a voice in a slightly different way that will help with background noise. Use interesting uh, language, helps engage people. Right, let's just look at our listening behaviours now that we've really touched on here. So you're trying to reflect back in your listening and some of this is a bit more, perhaps a bit related more to things outside work but will certainly apply still. So that reflective listening involves reflecting back the content and possibly the feeling that goes along with that. You may not need to talk about it but you might, especially if there's a mismatch. So we talked about this notion of paraphrasing, repeating back. It's not technically word for word if you're paraphrasing. Then you might want to reflect the feelings, as I mentioned. 
So we've got some examples there, and it says, you sound angry. So for example, you sound angry that when he, that he walked away when you were talking. Okay, so that's reflecting back. Perhaps someone said, oh yeah, he walked away from me when I was talking. He walked away from me when I was talking. Well, you sound angry that that happened. Mm -hmm. So you're reflecting back that. I can see you felt sad when she went away. So you're doing both things there. And we've just got another example. If someone's been talking for a while, then you're going to try and summarise what they said um, in a more succinct way. So that's a bit about our listening behaviours. Okay, let's switch gears now. So we've covered off on our listening and you're going to take that moving forward. Maybe you can practice it each other with each other and 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 talk about that you're using this this technique because what that'll be good for is keeping this stuff alive, at least within the group, and being mindful of techniques that you're using. So you can possibly do that and say, Oh, I'm using paraphrase with you now. <laughs> Did you notice? <laughs> <laughs> it can be a little bit of fun. So now we're switching directions a little bit and talking about something called moments of truth. Who knows of moments of truth? Okay, that's fine. So let's look at, at that. And let's look at the top part first. So this is an experience, the experience that a customer, client or stakeholder has when they first come in contact with your business. And that can occur in a number of different ways. And I've put here external customers. This is your traditional um, concept of moments of truth. So it could be me ringing in Ace Control and maybe talking to Nikki as my first port of call. And I get an impression from how Nikki answers the phone because I can't see her, what she actually says, can I understand what she says? All those sorts of things. I'm thinking about how professional it might sound. All sorts of things that we're not really conscious about, but these are moments of truth as a reflection of base control. So that could be by phone. I could go to the website, which I've done, um, and I look at that, and make deductions about this business. Okay, there are moments of truth. I've extended this concept a little bit. And we're morphing really from moments of truth through to customer service. And it's the experience that uh, colleagues have when they encounter you. So we've got the concept here is external customers. And now I'm going on to internal customers. So external customers, the clients, stakeholders, and so on, that each of you is a customer to the other. This is the concept of internal customer service. But your moments of truth technically is about those customers or, or people, stakeholders having some level of interaction with your business. And here's you know, just a little chart about those, where those moments of truth occur. We talked about the website, it might be an email inquiry, coming into the office, could be reports, letters, that sort of thing, phone we discuss, coming face to face. So it could be just looking uh, at the office physically, but then through to entering into the uh, building. I did mention to you that the name of your business down in the foyer is incorrect. It won't impact my whole experience with ACE Control, <laughs> but I was happy to pass it on. Because of that thing that you want to have it right, that it's a little tiny bit confusing, you think, oh, should be right because it's got the same control engineering at the end. But it a, a, was a little moment of truth for me, I suppose. Um, then we've got face-to-face, -face, working with customers, clients, stakeholders. So these are where people are building up their impression of what is this business. And then when it involves people, it's you, so then as a reflection of the business, and then we're building up moments of truth, not only with about the business, but also with them as that individual. Have you got any examples of a good or a poor moment of truth, some interaction with some business, the website, people? Let's 
experiences that you can think about when first encountering the business? So I had to, we've uh, recently bought a house <laughs> and we had to arrange a building inspection um, for it and so we contacted a uh, Prospect, which is a building inspection company and the guy Aspect, is it? Aspect, mm. yeah. And the, the guy on the phone, he was very knowledgeable and he, you know, he went through all the steps, you know, what was in our contract and he made it very clear what the service provided was and he made me feel very comfortable that what I was getting and um, that, 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 that they would support us if there was any issues. Um, so they were very upfront, so I was very uh, impressed by Housepect. Okay, great story. Yep. Okay. That was a nice one. I had yeah, a nice moment of truth with um, ADB, by the Hakashi <laughs> side, because I, I called for support. And then they gave me a number, so the product is now supported by Hakashi, so I put this the number, so I called Hakashi. And I basically told them I was looking for support, and I mentioned the name of the product. And obviously they knew nothing about it and they were fishing for information and they just kept on fishing for more information. It's like, I understand that the person attending the phone is not very knowledgeable, but they did not even seem to have the, the smallest clue what it was. So then I found out uh, the solution to the problem, so I just emailed them because they, they asked, they requested a lot more information. I thought, no, too hard, so I found <laughs> alternative resources, got it fixed. Thank you very much, it's been fixed. Mm -hmm. And then they just kept asking for feedback. <laughs> <laughs> After about a month of insisting, okay, fine, here is the feedback. <laughs> <laughs> what did you say? They weren't very good or were you no, no, kinder than that? <laughs> no, I, I tried to be kind, but basically let them know mm -hmm. that they give the impression that they have no knowledge of their own product. Mm -hmm. I mean, it will help them. Mm -hmm. Very, it will help them. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> they were very polite. I mean, I gave them like, because they were polite. Yes. They were professional, but the knowledge of their products it was definitely lacking. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. It's often easier to come up with those weaker <laughs> stories than, than this good story mm -hmm. that Matt shared with us, which I love. I just have to share my own experience. It's actually not about exact, directly about customer service anything but when we were getting some renovations done in our house we were getting quotes for replacing our kitchen and this fellow came in and it's 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 the message is check yourself if you're going to do something important because he came in and he had dried blood down his cheek from about there to there it was very distracting <laughs> and, and I, we didn't end up going with him for our kitchen <laughs> renovation. I don't think that was the clincher, but it was, it was very off-putting. So even, it, you know, maybe when you go out on site and things like that, just check. Just <laughs> check That's before really you enter <laughs> the building. You're representing this company. You want to do the very best you can, both for the company and for yourself. So good stories, moments of truth, moving on to our um, different forms of communication. You're going to choose these um, uh, depending on, well, it depends on numbers of factors, doesn't it? Which form of communication and that you're going to have with your uh, prospective stakeholder and so on. Personally, I prefer face-to-face, -face, but of course you're using a whole range of um, forms of communication. What about, what about when there's, okay, what about if there's some conflict, which is your best approach to use? Face to face. Face to face. Face to face, emoji. yep. Yeah. <laughs> what was that? Sorry. It's a uh, it's a World Emoji Day tomorrow. Yes. I missed that. Sm <laughs> smiley face or grumpy yeah. face? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, face if you can, but you know sometimes you can't. So what would you do next? What would your next choice be if you can't be face to face? Hmm. My choice would be phone. Phone. Uh -huh. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm. 
you wouldn't probably go for that. <laughs> no, fair enough. Anyway, those, it, it's worthwhile considering what your aim is with people and what's behind the communication that you want. So, we've gone from moments of truth, looking at, at those different environments for where we're communicating and impacting people um, as they experience the business. But then we're swinging through to our customer service model. Again, this is, this is one that I've made up. And I don't know if the acronyms, if you're able to use it. <laughs> PARCH, it's like a little stutter on the PARCH, <laughs> VIP. And these are some of the things that I believe are super important for good customer service. Really important. P, yep, for being prompt. And I've focused it on the phone, but it could be email, obviously. Could be face-to-face, -face too. You might not be able to meet with somebody immediately, but that you're looking to do it within a good um, period of time. What about emails? What do you aim to do in terms of responding to emails? Do you have some sort of measure? I see some laughter in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> Depends on what other work we're going on. Yeah. Um, if I'm quite into like testing or something, I don't want to be every five minutes going and answering <laughs> someone's email. Sure. It's going to distract from the process that I'm in, so it's not always going to be prompt, like maybe check at the beginning of the day and then end of the day. Sure. But even that, if you can get or, a response yeah. in a day, yeah. it's pretty good, I would think. Yeah, just try to within a reasonable time, but don't let it affect the work, other work you're doing. Mm -hmm. Depends what it is. It's so mm. hard to be prescriptive, isn't it? It depends what it is. Other thoughts about that? Emails? When, when, when you send them, always check that the other person has received them because sometimes they go, they get blocked. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they get blocked by their own company. Yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a really interesting point, actually. That's a really interesting point. How do you do that? Hold on. Yep. If you can, of course. Yeah. Okay. Negatives, I guess. So again. That's one of the negatives. Like if you're talking to someone directly, you're just going to get that so feedback. Mm -hmm. Whereas if it's an email written, mm -hmm. you're not going to get not necessarily. Yeah. Mm. I normally uh, put in the emails that please reply like whatever. If I didn't get reply in a day or two, then obviously I followed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that would fast track yeah. it a little bit to add that to the bottom of your email. Yeah put the onus on them then and then the onus is back on you to track those what you've sent out to whom and how long ago mm. okay but th that ties in with that um that feedback model doesn't it mm -hmm. so that's that's great okay so we've got our p for prompt but yeah what that period is we have to work out but you don't want to leave things too long um okay so we've got p for prompt p for professional and polite i i like the polite word in there as well. A is for and, that's too easy. <laughs> R is for reliable and I think that is very important, doing what you say you're going to do within a reasonable time frame. So C, being cheerful. <laughs> it's not always easy depending on what's going on but it's really something to be mindful about I, I believe. And when you go out on site, you know, I know I might be teaching you how to suck eggs here, but not all of us are aware. I go into supermarkets and I, I'm, I'm horrible underneath it, really. I assess the <laughs> checkout chicks and chaps. <laughs> are they able to smile at me? Because the ones that go, oh, hi, hi, how are you? I'm going, oh. <laughs> But if I get someone who can, and I've seen some very good people, you know, every person they're seeing, they're going, hi, how are you? And it is a fantastic skill. Yeah. And Nikki knows she's, she's front line. <laughs> <laughs> she's done it for 23 years. Yes, I have. <laughs> is it hurting here? Yeah, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yeah. But I also like this, remember when you smile, you look better looking. <laughs> when you're just in repose. It's true. 
people look all look better looking, so there's good reasons to smile. <laughs> Here we go, guys. <laughs> well, you're not going to smile for no good reason. Well, come on, <laughs> we can't see, but yeah, they But guys. keep that in mind so when you meet people, even when you're on the phone mm. and you're feeling a bit, you might be a little distracted or a grump, something grumpy, something's happened beforehand mm. that leaves you less than happy, mm. keep it in mind. You can actually hear differences in people's voices and they're smiling and friendly. The tone changes. So you've got to switch it on. And if you're not really feeling like that, my advice is you need to learn to act. Act as if you're happy. And there is, there is uh, research that says, well, the, the woman I've seen, a woman called Amy Cuddy on TED Talks. Have you seen that, Nikki? Yep. How did you find it? Uh, I look up all that stuff. Mm -hmm. yeah, all so, the time. so Amy Cuddy is an associate professor at Harvard and has done research into the feedback between nonverbal body language and sort of attitudes, if you like. Um, and then she's looked at how attitude impacts nonverbal body language. So if I sit like this. <laughs> <laughs> I leave an impression right? do I feel badly <laughs> no not really but Thank some you. of her research shows the more you sit like this actually the worse you become and you, you encompass that conversely she's done this work with um, power posing which is that there is a universal pose for winners and it's this and you watch people at the Olympics football all of that it's some version of that so some of her research has looked at people doing these power poses and holding them for a period and then doing an experiment where they and others who don't do power poses come in and they're applying for jobs faux, faux jobs pretend jobs and then and then the examiner is choosing those people based on, based on how they present. Well, the people who've done the power poses get selected more frequently. So we get this, what her stuff has found out, that you get this feedback loop that body language can um, impact attitude and impressions and attitude can impact your body language. So similarly, I believe it's the same with communication. And, and your body language is smiling, you know, you'll feel happier. You feel better, even if you're feeling a bit grumpy when you arrive on site for some reason. Put the smile on your dial, as they say, you'll feel better. Anyway, that's a little bit of a digression in a sense, but it's about being cheerful, and I think it's very important. H, also for helpful. That's what you want to do, help people. And then finally, treat everyone like they're a VIP. So this is your customer service model for your external customers and with each other. So we will, you, you will expect everyone to be walking around smiling at each other <laughs> <laughs> over the next, the next three months. <laughs> but um, just something to keep in mind all these factors and that they're important when you're dealing with each other. I just will slip over to a thing, uh, what to watch out for on the on the phone, unless you haven't worked them <laughs> out. What are you laughing at, Nikki? Which one uh, do you like? Eat food, chew gum, yep. yawn, talk to others, cough, into the phone. Yeah. Speak up. No, I don't do any of that. <laughs> well I don't, done. I don't, I don't. And you're smiling at the bottom of this. I always <laughs> smile. Yeah, exactly. So just watch out. I think the one really uh, that is most important probably is watching out for that one. Trying to multitask a bit. We've all been guilty. Put my, I'll put my hand yeah. up. Yeah, of trying to do a couple of things. Yeah, this person's really, you know, chatting on too much and I can do a few things here. But they will pick it up somehow. Okay, so that's a little bit about your customer service, managing the phone, and being that professional, great communicator that you are. Now we're moving on to some different types of language. 
that we're using. I'm just looking for 37. Right. We're doing well. Terry. Okay. <laughs> Hello there. Hi. Oh, it's okay. <laughs> Jerry. Welcome. You're Terry, I gather. Jerry. Jerry. Oh, Jerry, that's right. <laughs> yes, I, yes, you've been here before. Yeah, yes. <laughs> Terry know how to smile. <laughs> <laughs> and he's chewing gum. Anyone <laughs> 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 else? You need to pop into your phone. <laughs> 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 okay, so we have got Terry here. Okay. You don't have to. It was just, you see, these are no no's for the phone. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that just happened to be there. That's why okay. we, I reflected that back to you. Yeah. And I just <laughs> spotted it. <laughs> Oh dear. Okay. <laughs> what not to do? I've got a few types of language that we might use. Not, I have, I've limited what I've put here. But open and closed questions, are you all familiar with open and closed questions? The majority of people are, that's for sure. Um, so yes, no responses to closed questions or single words. Open open questions. Okay, everyone knows how to do them. Right, can I have an open question, please? <laughs> can someone make one up? Mm. How, how did you get into the, this profession? How did I get into this profession? Yeah, that's fairly open. <laughs> yep, yep. Um, uh, it's probably similar to, a very good question if you want to get people to chat, want them to do the talking, it's similar, slightly different wording. What motivated you to become a an engineer? What mm -hmm. motivated you to... So it's similar, mm -hmm. just slightly different wording. We saw that question on the screen. <laughs> See, I can't even recognise it. <laughs> you, you're ahead. Good on you, Vikram. <laughs> Another open question. A simple question, tell me about yourself. Or <laughs> yeah, exactly so. Vikram's topping the class today. I'm <laughs> a <laughs> <And> good listener. <laughs> so, what else? We, tell me about your experiences travelling to Europe. So that's broader as well. Yeah. Yeah. We've talked about clarification sorts of questions. So what? You, so is what you're saying, so that with your, your example, um, with your technical expert, that might be a question you can use because you're really trying to work out what they're saying. Do you mean? So that's when you're reflecting back. And then we've got our polite language, and I'm sure you all know most of this. With all due respect, that's a good one when there's differences of opinion. <laughs> that's what that's for. <laughs> um, may I suggest, excuse me, I'm afraid I can't. Um, actually, I remember a client of mine who was from South Africa. And she, when she first came here, I think she was very confused by um, how we say, uh, and, and, and her comment was especially with regards to administrative staff, that you say, oh, would you mind, could you please, excuse me, um, could you please do such and such? Because I think, I think the thing was in South Africa, you were a lot more direct <coughs> with the instructions to admin staff. Um, than we are. So we use those strong politeness markets. So it's interesting culturally to consider these things. Mm -hmm. Excuse me, I'm afraid I can't. Um, when you can't do something, I will typically say I'm sorry I can't do such and such. That's my way of softening the blow, but I found that one a little bit different and interesting for me rather than that direct apology, which you don't really need to apologise for. But uh, that's my, um, that's how I approach it. But I'm afraid I can't come to Kim's training on Friday afternoon, for example. <laughs> Could be something someone may have said. So there are different types of language, but also, and we talked about apologies, um, but appreciation. Telling others when you appreciate what they what they've done, what they're doing. I think that's an interesting one. I don't know how the culture works here, but with whether you use that with each other. But I had Nikki send me an email that said, 
awesome. <laughs> and I really liked it. I mean, I just thought that's that. It's, it's Sorry, that's simple. my language. <laughs> it's absolutely fine by me. But it was just, it was one word, very positive. And I went, oh, I'm just, I'm just bringing my data projector. It's but awesome. I'm glad it's awesome. <laughs> so a little thing can, can mean quite a bit to people. Yes. So that um, showing appreciation really is useful. Um, amongst your colleagues and of course you're going to do that with your stakeholders and clients and things I've got no doubt then apology apologies and I've put here really in uh, more acute circumstances <laughs> well I think we've got to cover off on everything you know whether it happens or not you know this doesn't happen ever here great <laughs> but that you're covered in case um, and if it never happens to you, but again, we're thinking beyond the office too, and can be things at home where you might be well under guard and under control here, because you are ace control, but um, when you're at home, you might be a little less, you know, controlled, shall we say. But it's that thing of, you know, it's worthwhile apologising. <laughs> when you've made mistakes, when you've lost it, whatever's happened. Um, <laughs> Uh, and on a daily basis. <laughs> <laughs> um, but probably more typically would be when errors have happened for the office. I dare say that's the main thing. My approach is to apologise. Sometimes people don't. Okay, so this particular styles of language, we've talked a little bit about questions, appreciate, showing appreciation, apologies. Um, but now I want to move on to uh, assertive language. So we're looking at assertive language really um, to manage when it's conflict to some degree but when things aren't quite going right between you and probably a colleague. It could be with a client, maybe. But we've got a, a format for dealing with this. And I must say, I have absolutely used it myself. And I might share with you that example, but let's look at the format. So it's about not being railroaded into things that, you know, really don't work for you. It's about not overreacting to situations where there's differences of opinion and so on. Not too, not aggressive, not passive, not passive aggressive about landing right in the middle and asserting how you feel. So it is definitely based on feelings and typically that you might put your feelings up front. Now if it's work related, you're going to put that in a particular way. Um, and I think the language will, will differ a little bit from work to home, if you might use this at home. You know, I might say to my husband, I don't know, I feel really upset when, what would it be? Oh, when you slam the pillow on the bed when I'm trying to sleep <laughs> and um, it wakes me up. So that's stating, I feel really upset, whatever I said, when you slam the pillow on the bed when I'm trying to sleep, um, how, how it impacts you. It means I can't sleep actually when you slam the pillow down. Uh, I might say, um, uh, yeah, I get upset and I don't want to talk to you for, for half an hour or something. Could be something like that. Can I please ask you to? So you're looking for your alternative. You're asking someone to change their behaviour. Could I please ask you to? And, and I've done this, this is virtually this scenario with my husband. <laughs> Can I please ask you not to slam the pillow down on the bed when I'm sleeping? And that was that was easily solved. But I did have to do I did have to go through it. Um, so it's stating feelings, describing the other person's uh, behaviour objectively, what that person has actually done. Um, not like, oh, you're really inconsiderate, you know, with, with me in the morning. You know, you wake me up every morning or something. But no, it's not about that. It's actually about the pillow slamming on the, on the other pillow. So you make sure that you use objective, objective descriptions to help you. 
where if you need to talk about the um, the impact on you, I have found useful to say, look, it's really in, our relationship is really important to me, and that you make that the foundation of why you need to talk about this stuff. I felt. So I had this with a colleague who's in the office next door to me. I work in a strata titled office block in West Perth. We have a car park. We ha don't have allocated bays you can park anywhere, except he used to pay park in one bay reliably every day. Then one day I decided, oh, I think I might park in that bay just for a change. And so he came into me going, you know, why did you park in my car bay? How come you park there? And I went, well, because I felt like it. <laughs> and it was ab absolutely true. You know that I park there every day. You know, you shouldn't have done this. And sort of with roughly that tone, and I was pretty mortified after that for quite a time. I don't know how long it was um, between when that happened and me speaking up. It took me a while. I absolutely went through this. I, In the meantime, I would avoid him because I, I was quite upset about it, but I absolutely went through this five-part assertion, and he had no idea he'd upset me whatsoever, um, and we were sort of, oh, oh. Um, but the good thing was, as a result of that, um, we got to work together on, uh, on a committee together, and we were, you know, good buddies after that, but that was the great benefit, it stopped me from avoiding him had a good relationship thereafter that I could sort of ventilate that stuff in that objective way. So that's a that's a bit about asserting and then we've got another slide on that. Um, okay, uh, other ways of dealing with you know, quite negative behaviour. Well, it's, it's a pretty general uh, overview. Just think about someone working in the front line at a hospital, for example, and what they might experience and the sort of assertive language that they might need to say. Um, don't yell and swear at me and call me derogatory names. I'm not going to continue until you, I won't continue until you stop. I'm willing to discuss this with you, but not when you're yelling at me. And you're trying to keep your tone um, moderated, because if it's not moderated, then that can escalate your environment, okay? You don't want to escalate this. Um, I do want to talk about this with you, but we need to make a time to meet when we're both calmer. Um, can we please do that? Can I get you to make a time with me? Or what else have we got? Aha, uh -huh. try and slow down your speech and soften your tone, pause a bit more. Okay. Let's move on. And I thought I was zooming along and well on time, and probably a little bit high, but we'll have a catch up. So that's about using assertive uh, language. And closely associated, really, is management of complaints, if people ever should complain directly to you. Mm. Could it be about this business or in the future about other businesses? Have I had complaints at my work? Mm not about my business directly, or there might have been something I've had to attend to. Um, but the interesting thing, I'll move on to the next um, slide. So we're looking at the value of complaints, which is 95% of complainants will do business with you again if you solve the problem for them on the spot. 70% will do business with you again if its problem is solved within some reasonable time. And 90% won't return if the problem is never solved. And the clincher, unhappy customers tell 6 to 11, or maybe more people on average about their lousy experience. And I had a great experience like that where many years ago when I was doing a unit in human resource management, my lecturer at UWA got up in front of a group of, oh, about 70 people and said, never buy a Mitsubishi car because they're lousy. <laughs> so he really exercised his, his muscle and sharing his complaints with as many people as he could. So that sometimes happens. So we want to manage um, these people who, for whatever reason, aren't, ha aren't happy. And you will potentially get to use your very professional 
skills, communication skills with them to manage that. Here are your key themes. You know, really being dispassionate about it in a sense. You're just there to listen to whatever the story is. The story could be about you, it might not be about you, it might be separate from you as well. But your job is to listen and listen well and take on board what they're telling you, very important. Um, and that you want to show that you're keen to help, that you want their feedback is the other thing. You're happy to receive their feedback. I'm just recalling a time when I, where I worked elsewhere where um, I absolutely had to go through all of this, um, these principles, if you like, um, and show concern for them, whatever they've gone through. And if they're very upset, you might say things like, I can understand you feel like that, um, bringing that em empathy forth. You'll come in with your paraphrasing, potentially, if you need to. You might be writing notes if it's the right environment, if it's a long story, maybe, maybe not, but you want to reflect back on the information that you're hearing. And then, and then how you're going to solve the problem for the person. Now, it might be something you can do, uh, or it might be something that you need to take to management. So you have to make that decision about what the plan is for you. So just looking at that, you know, so you're just using that language, tell me what happened, you know, what happened at the beginning. Sometimes if people are complaining, they're very nervous indeed. So you want to um, look at that so that if their stories might not be sequential, you might have to help them put that information together in a logical way for you, potentially. Um, so what have we got here? I do want to find out what happened, please tell me. And so you might have to say, so what happened first, then what, then what? Um, who were you dealing with, etc. Then you're using your clarification technique or your paraphrasing and checking back. And then I will, personally, I'm always happy to apologise to people. Being, um, and it can be, I'm very sorry that that happened to you. Okay, it's about that. Um, apology really for their experience and showing that empathy. Okay. So furthermore, you're telling them you're, you're keen to address the problem, you're going to do something about it, and you may even check back with them. Have you got a suggestion to us for how this might be solved to your satisfaction? You may or may not be able to say that. Otherwise, then you're coming in and saying, well, either one, I can, what I can do for you is, you're solving the problem, uh, I mentioned them suggesting the, the solution, and thirdly, do you need to take this further up the line so that the organisation knows or management knows? And then the other aspect to that is, I believe always you want to give them a time frame for when you're getting back to them. So what I will do is I will get back to you within a day to tell you what's going to happen. Now you might not have a solution by then, but you can always ring back and say, I've spoken to management, what they're doing is talk to that process and then I'll get back to you in another day. You might check back with them, is that okay? Then when you've got to the point of the um, providing the solution, you will still check back with them. You want to keep that person as your very happy customer, and and it is it's the truth that people will come back to you, and in fact they'll speak um, glowingly when you solve those problems when people are complaining. I used to work for a um, smoothie and ice cream franchise quite some years ago, and we had complaints about some of our stores about the customer service can't remember what, what was done or the actual um, issue, but it's a complaint about a store. I remember driving out in the pouring rain to the northern suburbs somewhere taking free ice cream because I absolutely wanted them to be happy customers so that they would return and they wouldn't tell those six to 11 people. I don't know the end of that story, but it doesn't matter. I felt very satisfied that that was quite a reasonable thing reasonable solution rather than one ice cream cone. I gave them a whole container. So, 
All right, I'm going to move on very briefly because you've got these in the notes. It's just a little bit about conflict. So what I've done today is really focused a lot on managing the worst scenarios, really, where you have to assert, where you've got complaints, where you've got conflict. Uh, in the thought that well, everything else will be a whole lot easier, won't it? But we have covered off on those, some of those things too. Use of questions, reflective language, listening, all those sorts of things that help make you that professional that you are, but using your communication very professionally and mindfully. So just a bit, a whistle-stop tour of conflict. What happens, what is it when two or more people have differences, either real or perceived? Now that's an interesting point, isn't it? Real or perceived. They're both they're sort of still conflict. Um, and these are the sorts of conflict that you can have. Sometimes we also talk about systemic conflict, meaning conflict um, within the way the organisation is set up rather than with individuals. This one we're talking about individual conflict rather than systemic conflict. I haven't touched on that. Yeah, and, and the sorts of environments that can create that, different personalities, leadership styles, actual issues, misunderstandings and so on. And here are our ways of dealing with it. Hello there. Welcome, Welcome back. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> oh, you've missed such good stuff. <laughs> but um, that you'll be able to copy some notes. So sometimes we, you know, I should have the, uh, what is it, the emu or the ost ostrich with its head in the sand. Sometimes we'll ignore it. Now, and there's a there's a very valid case for ignoring some conflict. It's true. Other conflict can just grow, and we don't want that. Sometimes we'll try and smooth it over. You know, it might tie in with ignoring it, pretending it's not there. We might try and force our opinions on people, but then moving through to actually what we what we propose to do is either compromise and work in collaboration. See if we can solve this. It's a problem. It's a problem to be solved. And you engineers know all about that stuff. Oh, Actually, you are experts. I'm not an engineer. Oh, <laughs> but you are. By the the by the you're an engineer in, in a year or two. I'm a trainee. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But uh, you're probably associated with a few up at Rio Tinto in your time, so yeah. you probably picked it up like osmosis. Yeah. Okay, so this is what we're trying to do. Yeah. Firstly, work out: Do I need to, do I need to approach this, or is it something I can leave behind and get over? And it's true that sometimes, if we do that, and years later you think, "I oh, know there was something, you know, that really bugged me and with that person. I can't even remember what it is." So, um, but so think carefully, give it, make a considered decision, and you certainly don't want to try and. Um, solve conflict when you are highly emotional. Mm -mm. Uh, be that angry, upset, any of those uh, strong, strong emotions, make a time. So my example with my colleague, I absolutely um, worked out a time to talk to him about that. When I was ready, having gone through my script, um, to talk to him. And that, I think that's one of the points about communication is that we don't ever think about writing things out. If you've got to give a speech, you probably will, but you, you can script out things that are difficult. It's really, really valuable, and I have certainly done that many times. Um, all right, so we may possibly make a time to meet if we can. Sometimes you can't, but in a in a place that works for us, you might negotiate that place. The time you will certainly not negotiate, if you can do that. And your whole aim, of course, is to find the mutually agreeable solution, or commonly called the win-win. You know, there's whole books on managing conflict. I'm giving you a couple of sheets. Um, okay. And keeping in mind that if you can't solve the conflict between the two of you, even with the best of intentions, um, that you might need to escalate that. And certainly in a work environment that, that becomes a reality um, and that you might need someone to be a facilitator or a mediator if you can't solve that problem. Okay, so... 
just about to run out of battery. Ah, there we go. Okay, so I think what's really important about this, if we've got this disagreement between the two of us, that you keep the discussion focused on, you know, what I want to do is to talk to you about this, and I'm really, um, what I want to do is work out a solution for us that's going to, you know, I come back to the relationship every time. I want to build a relationship. It doesn't matter. It's not about being good bosom buddies. It's about being able to work together, especially for the benefit of the business. Um, that's all we need to do. Uh, that each person is entitled to speak and that you really should, and this is one of my little things that I've had to work on, just be careful you don't interrupt and go, but oh, what about, and this is where you're using those listening skills that we practiced earlier, try and listen, take on board the facts. You too, when you're expressing your opinion, you want to talk to the facts, keep that name calling away, or any of that sort of negative type of language. Again, prepare it beforehand. What are the key points I want to cover? What are my concerns? Um, you want to identify areas potentially where you agree and where you disagree. Of course, the gold is on the agreement side and you're trying to search for solutions. And getting a consensus is ideal. Um, you might need to brainstorm your different ideas. And of course, with brainstorming, you the approach is you're just putting ideas down and you are not debating those points then in the brainstorming process. You get the ideas down, and I don't know, again, if you all know this, then when all the ideas are complete, without any qualification, then you go through and look at the pros and cons to help you solve your conflict so that hopefully it, it will never occur again. So we have covered a, bit, a large amount of territory here today. I talked to a colleague in my building who works in hospitality and manages um, uh, hotels. He's just going up to groom a lucky fellow to start managing a hotel up there. And I said, oh yes, I'm training these people today and I'm covering conflict resolution, certain language, complaints management, customer services said, mm. You're doing quite a lot there. So I have done quite a lot with you. Conflict management courses can cover a day or two. So we've had a whistle stop tour here as reminders of how you can use your language professionally to help develop those relationships and to help build it your brand and your business because this all ties in with our first presentation and by doing that you know what happens people want to work with you you build your career and if you have eyes on working in senior roles that's where it'll take you you can't go into senior roles in management without really without good foundations in professional communication so congratulations everyone thanks for joining me yeah, so, uh, i hope everyone has enjoys training the communication corporate communication and training 2.0 and i have been observing everyone is working very hard tonight and to you know to actually learn to absorb all the wealth of knowledge from kim so kim thank you very much for being with us and uh, we truly enjoy uh, your, you know, your teaching, and, uh, your education, your wealth of knowledge, and uh, uh, again, your appearance as well. So. On behalf of Ace, I'll, uh, yeah, I, I thank you for your service, and, uh, yeah, and uh, I look forward to our Ace Corporate Communication Training 3.0. <laughs> I look forward to it too, you, very much. And look, I'm feeling like I'm an extended part of the team here. I mean, it's a delight to come back and to have you all here. And I think those that could be here were here. Maybe you did say you have to be here. I, 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 you don't need to tell me that. But no, it's been a delight working with you again. And I certainly look forward to another round if it goes ahead so that would be fantastic thank you thank you it's an honor
Thank you.